Hi, property people. Thanks for joining us today. As always, we will be sharing ideas, experiences, problems, and solutions for property people like you. Our interviews will get you to know some of the most active professionals in the industry that have achieved some pretty impressive stuff. Hearing about their successes, failures, strategies, and insights, we really hope you enjoy. Hi everybody, welcome to Property People. Today I am joined by Manny Chopra. Manny Chopra is a developer and landlord. Um, she's based in Reading. Um, she's part of a husband and wife duo as well. She does a lot of stuff with her husband, Romy. Um, also the host of the J6 networking event, a beautiful networking event in, uh, in Reading. And always bringing property people together. And I thought it'd be a good idea for Manny to join us today, talk a little bit about her property experiences, problems, solutions, and thanks for joining us today. Hey, hi Sam, how are you doing? Very good, very good. All the better for being here with you so you can share with us some of the insights because I know you're super duper, incredibly active, um, doing a variety of different things. And it'll be really good for you to share with everybody that watches this um, a little bit about what you do. So where Fantastic. I like to start. Listen, thanks for having me, Sam. Really appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. The pleasure is all ours. Where I like to start is to find out a little bit about, more about you, Manny. And going all the way back to school, what kind of person were you at school? And was property something that you always thought you'd get into? It's funny, I never thought you'd ask this question. I actually went to an all-girls school, and believe it or not, I was quite shy. Uh, <laughs> can you imagine, in a, in a class of 60 girls, and in a year of 180 girls, it was crazy. Um, I don't believe you were to, shy, though. Honestly, I, I didn't sell a child with all the other girls out there. But, <laughs> you know, I think I was, yeah, I think I was shy, but at the same time, I had a little group of friends. Uh, it was hard back then. I went to a convent school, so very strict. You had to play by the rules, you know. If you wanted to ask a question, you had to put your hands up in a certain way. It was wow. like, it was crazy. But, you know, I think when you're looking back, it probably stands you in good stead because it's the discipline it brings in you. And I think that's where I get my discipline from now. Like, you know, I am quite a disciplined person. And sometimes I think, oh, where did it come from? I think it's come from all those, you know, the schooling and then all the other bits and pieces in my life along the way. Very good. And was it, was, you know, property, was that what you used to go to bed dreaming about? Not at all. I'm going <laughs> to lie about it now and say, ooh, I was dreaming. No. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just as uh, real as, it, as, it, as they come. Not really. You know, it's funny you ask that question. Um, and I think I'm going to touch on a slightly emotional subject for me here. But I was one of four kids and uh, the eldest of four. I had two younger sisters and a brother. And... Uh, you're never going to believe this. I and mean, you think I'm going to make this up, but we lived in a one bedroom flat. Wow. Like actually the six of us, my, so all of us, my siblings, my parents. And looking back now, I wouldn't know this then, but it was actually a studio, a big studio flat converted into a one bed. Can you believe wow. it? I mean, it was all of, I don't know, five, 600 square feet, I think. And uh, we didn't have a room to ourselves. That's how... You know, so there was, there was this dream of property, actually. To be fair, I dreamed of having my own room. That was my dream. Because all my friends had their own room or they were sharing it with a sibling. Well, we had nothing. We had, uh, we had two beds in the living room where we'd, whoever jumped up first on the bed at night, they'd get to wow. sleep. On. And the other two would then sleep on the floor with, you know, duvets and proper, you know, we'd make up our own beds on the floor. But that was it. That was how we lived. And it wasn't such a bad life. I know it's looking back, it sounds like, oh my God, you poor you. And yes, of course, we, we had the sort of, you know, we had food on the table, we had all of that, but we weren't rich. We weren't, and in Mumbai, because that's where I grew up, real estate was, you know, is, is big. It was, it was like living in Tokyo type thing. You know, you had apartments, apartment living, and most people who were sort of the upper middle class were living in two bedroom flats. So it wasn't like mm. people bungalows or houses it wasn't like that it was just apartment living we just had a small apartment interesting so from those humble beginnings you obviously had some tenacity and some passion and drive to be able to build from there 
to what you have achieved today. I mean, in terms of um, three words that would best describe you today, which three words would you choose? I'd say frank uh, or honest, whichever you want to look at it, because one people might say you're too frank or you say it how it is. Say how it is. I'd say determined and uh, I'd say dynamic. Oh, I love dynamic. Yeah. It's energetic, what? dynamic, I guess all of them come together, yeah. Yeah, no, actually, that's funny because I would absolutely agree from knowing um, uh, about your journey and, and what you've been doing and, and people that know you and when they speak about you, I would absolutely definitely say that you tick all those boxes and certainly dynamic as well because I'd like to go into a little bit more detail about how you started with property. So, you know, coming to, to the UK, um, what made you, how did you, did you stumble across it or did you, did you start to see that there was something at what point did you start to see there was something in property that you wanted to pursue? Uh, to be honest with me, I think it was more of a need to get out of my job. I had an IT job and I was making about two, two and a half thousand a month net after paying tax and what have you. I had two young kids at the time and I was like, is this it? You know, this was the question I was asking myself. I mean, is this me just for the rest of my life? I was, you know, in my mid thirties then and it just wasn't stacking up, you know, I mean, from the outside, you'd say, oh, you've got a great job, you have two young kids, but nothing was winning. I wasn't being a great mom because I couldn't be there for them and blah, blah, blah. I wasn't being great at my work. And there were certain aspects of work I did enjoy, like team leading and what have you. But in general, it was an IT job. And IT jobs are great. Don't get me wrong. I'm not cussing it down, but it's what you want out of life, right? Yeah. It was, freedom wasn't there. And Looking back, I think I was very, I think that was very important to me. The, the flexibility wasn't there. And, you know, I didn't just think property, but then suddenly there was this conference that came out, Robert Kiyosaki, the National Achievers okay. Conference, back in 2010, this was. And, you know, we had some properties, actually. Funnily enough, you asked that question. When we were in our jobs, me and my husband both, we had um, some spare funds because we were like double income, no kids. Um, we bought a couple of buy-to-lets in London, funnily enough. And when I looked at it like in 2009, 2000, I thought, wow, they've like gone up four or five times in value. And they're rented, they're managed by an agent. We didn't even know it, ex you know, to be there, it was in the background. We didn't even think about it. And we thought, well, if that's what can happen to property without actually doing anything to it, can you imagine if you actually intentionally did and have a plan, exactly. and have a strategic plan, then, what you can achieve. And I think the, the enormous, you know, the thought about that was actually what made me, inspired me actually. I thought, well, actually this could be really big, you know, and that's when I put myself into it and learned about it and stuff like that. So, yeah, I guess so, so this guy, Robert Kiyosaki, he's always um, somewhere around these kinds of conversations. People are starting to look for some sort of wealth creation, uh, understanding of finance and, and, uh, and, and the ability to create something for their family. And you went to an event and that started to plant certain seeds about how great property could be. Um, so what was, um, what was the first deal that you did? It took me a long time to do that. I think it's, I think, I think it life tests you, you know, it's your first deal. I don't know about you. And, you know, I'm sure we can do another zoom call about your life. And I'd like to know more <laughs> about you. Um, it was hard, uh, but I knew very earlier on because what I did in 2010, it took a sabbatical from work. I didn't sort of just leave. I just said, I'll take it off and see where that takes me. But my goal was that by the end of that 12 months, I want to achieve like about two grand a month net. Right, in, right. Around that area, because then I can just quit my job and you know sack my boss and all that sort of stuff. So I said, hey, Chamos, because look, buy to let's, you, we know it. Can't do a hundred, couple of hundred grand, a uh, couple of hundred pounds a month. It's just not going to do anything. So very early on, I realized hey, tomorrow is the strategy I want to go for. So I looked at Slough. That was my first sort of patch that I looked at. Couldn't find anything. fit the criteria. Eventually, I think after six, eight months or so of looking, I found my first deal in Bracknell. And funnily enough, it didn't meet any of the requirements that I learned in the courses. So in the courses, they said buy BNB, which is below market value. Yeah wasn't below market value. They said buy unmodernized, really run down, very tired looking, so you can add value to it. There wasn't any of that. It was a 
five bedroom, large semi-detached property in Bracknell, uh, which we knew was a very big uh, employment sort of stroke, a second tier IT uh, economy. Um, and I knew that as soon as I buy it, I could rent it out as six letterable rooms. And I knew that it could get me over thousand pounds net cash flow, you know, thousand, twelve hundred pounds a month net or slightly more, depending on how I manage my costs. And that was my main criteria back then. So that's when I bought it. We bought it for 305,000. So back into 2010, 2011, that was quite a lot of money. And people would think you're mad to pay that much for a rented property, you know what I mean? But it met, it ticked all the boxes for me. The cash flow was a big one. And we rented it almost immediately. It didn't even need painting or nothing. So literally, wow. it did. I think we had one stud wall that we had to do between the very big living room to create a six bedroom. And then that was it. So that was my first deal. Bought it for 305. Obviously left a lot of my money in there. That was the big problem. But I didn't see it as a problem straight away. I knew I'd worry about it when the time was right. So I got my uh, cash flow. I think it was under 1,500 pounds maybe. And, um, and I was happy by it. Well, that makes sense because your focus really was to, to buy back your time. So you just wanted to get things going. You wanted to buy a nice property in a nice area, which was a good store of value. But what you could also do at the same time with the income that you've generated is buy back your time. So then you'd really start to think like a CEO and start to actually build a business. And that clarity is probably helped you get to where you are today. Yeah, I agree. Very good. And so once you'd done that and you'd positioned yourself in a in a com relatively comfortable uh, spot where you can start to think what were the next steps because now since then I know that you've built a portfolio I know that you're doing multi-unit developments can I take us through that progression as to how you went in different ways and what the next steps were for you so unfortunately for me it wasn't it didn't meet my criteria of the two and a half thousand that I was talking about so I unfortunately had to go back to work for a bit only about six yeah. months so, and was reluctantly, obviously, I went back and felt like a bit of a failure as well because my target oh. was, oh, and, you know, I was a bit blase as well, to be fair. Oh, I've got, you know, a little bit of money to invest. How hard can it be? 12 months, I'll crack this thing, you know, very easily. I'm not going back. <laughs> like you said, you speak to yourself and then you realize, damn, I'm having to go back to work. So I had to read <laughs> Humble Park, which I did. Um, and very quickly, actually, I, I'd say not even less than six months properly into it, I found a really good unmodernized property. Again, okay. now I started to learn about the area and this sort of ticked all, ticked all, ticked all the boxes, as it were, you know, it was a probate. It was uh, very run down. It hadn't been uh, modernized since, I don't know, 10, 15 years before that. And it was uh, cheap as chips. It was 200,000, I think I paid for it or something wow. like that, 205. So, Compared to 305 I paid for, you know, six months ago for the other one in Bracknell, right? Um, and this was going to have the opportunity without any, doing much to it, but obviously internally refurbishing it, but no extension, I think five letterable rooms. So I found that and then very quickly I quit my job and that was me then financially free in about 2012. So those two HMOs pretty much paid for my two and a half grand. And then I sort of, you know, took a back, like, well, took a breath, really. And then I thought, well, what next? Uh, unfortunately, my money had all run out. I had no money left. Right. Uh, so I was like, okay, what do I do now? And so I started sourcing properties, actually. And that right. was a huge learning curve for me. And I'd never do it again, even if you pay me. Uh, why? Was, Tell, why? 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 What, what, what happened? Really hard work, because investors were very hard to please. And even if you had all the tick boxes and, you know, it was cheap, it had five letterable rooms, whatever you gave them, this just wasn't good enough. You know? And they were indecisive and you're relying on somebody else. And ideally, I'd buy those properties myself, to be fair. And hindsight is a wonderful thing, as you know, right? Yeah. And, you know, hindsight, I would have probably had investors working with me or joint venturing, you know. And at the time, I don't think I had the confidence quite much, you know, in myself to say, well, actually... I'll borrow the money from you. I'll do it myself. And then I'll just pay you the money back once I've done the project. But, you know, as I said, hindsight's a wonderful thing. So I did sourcing for a couple of years. That was quite frustrating for me, but a huge right. learning curve, nevertheless. Um, and then I realized I need to take power back in my own hands. And as I mentioned to you, money had run out. Um, I did have um, equity in my property, in my home. 
but my husband wasn't very keen to sort of use that. So we had to sort of play, you know, nice as well, because <laughs> marriage and work sometimes doesn't go hand in hand. Yeah, I was going to talk to you about that after in a little bit, but certainly refinancing your own home, which is your security, is never an easy decision to make. For me it was, but never for him. So <laughs> I can understand where he came from as well, you know. So we, we took a decision, executive decision, you know, we're not going to refinance the house. Um, and then I think eventually we had some refinance money come through and you know I think the ball started rolling then um, so I then slowly slowly had a few more HMOs I did and here I am I own a small portfolio of HMOs and some single lets and then obviously as you know I started doing development in 2015 2016 so I've got a small portfolio of broker flats as well now. Amazing I mean 2010 was is in the grand scheme of things, a decent time to get into the market because we did see some good capital growth, especially in London, the Southeast, between 2010 and 2015, especially around London. We had the Olympics on the east side. Um, so it's, uh, it, it was a good time and that allowed you to refinance a little bit as the properties were going up, get a little hands on a little bit more equity. Um, and then you got into development. So the development step from HMO landlord to, to full-time developer or doing larger projects is not easy. I mean, there's the whole um, uncertainty around planning, for example. How did you start to embark on that journey? How did you start to get comfort? Did you surround yourself with other property people that, um, that were able to point out, you know, this is a site that I'm looking at. Well, these are the things you need to look out for. How did you go about doing all of that? Uh, the first one was a very interesting project, actually. And as you said, planning is this maze, right? No matter how much you know about it, it's never enough. But I worked with two business partners on that first project. One right. of them was right. very experienced in planning and he was doing, uh, I think he was doing schemes, you know, like back garden plots and things like that. Yeah. And, and get secure. So he had a lot of planning experience. The other guy, Simon, he was more of a sourcer type person. He'd see something and he had a great eye for properties. So the one we found, the first one that we did was a, a bungalow actually it was a, a detached bungalow on a very large plot so the plot just to give you an um, idea of size was about 900 square meters plot um, and the bungalow was this, a single story bungalow so we knew on that street itself there were bung bungalows previously that were converted into blocks of flats so there was precedence not that it means anything in planning yeah. the fact that it's been done on that street means it's a it's a positive thing uh, so what we actually did it as a buy to let but as a buy to let 75 percent loan to value paid uh, between us i think it was about 150 100 uh, we bought it for i think 475,000. right uh, 25 percent deposit on it and before we bought it we did a quick pre-app with reading council and we got a great positive response now we know pre-apps are not legally binding yeah and we knew that that could change, right? But we were ready to take the gamble because the property itself, if you did nothing to it, I just add another flow and created a house out of it, you'd be able to make some money, you know what I mean? So yeah, uh, yeah. we knew that there's a fallback plan. Um, and then on that basis, we went into planning straight after we completed on it. Uh, and we got planning very pretty much, you know, within the time scales you would expect for about eight flats. Oh, well, actually, yeah, eight flats. Um, and then... We had some section 106 problems, you know, like the 106 agreements, which where you have to pay the council. So that was huge. So they, they said, your planning is subject to 202,000 pounds of 106, which was a huge amount That's for the team of eight flats only. But we took it and we said, we'll worry about that later because we didn't want to let go of the planning, right? So we got the planning, but then Simon and Martin, the two partners decided they don't want to do the build. Right. So I bought them out then. So we, what we did was I got a joint venture partner to come in with me and I had a one third share you know, because we're three of us. What I did was I upped my share to 50%. Uh, and so I borrowed some funds from an investor at a fixed return, paid in the money and I got a joint venture partner to pay the 50%. And then we went in and got development funding for it. So it was I mean, literally everything you could throw at a development. I, I learned about it, which was great, I think, for my first deal. That is impressive. And about the S106 very quickly, usually you don't have to pay what, uh, under nine units. So how come they slap that on you with only eight units? Reading. They have got the central government initiative. Uh, the central guidelines is 10, as you rightly said. Right. Uh, 
they have fought the central government on it and um, apparently local press local takes precedence over central so right. okay went, yeah and you did okay and you went with it and that's fine because you got the the deal done uh you bought your joint venture partners out at the planning stage and went right through to the development stage as well we did reduce our 106 to 70 grand we fought it oh wow well done that's incredible yeah we got another planning consultant involved who specializes uh, looking at viability they look at viability studies and then uh, as a result and to be fair again Looking back, they did say to us, look, if you stay with us for another few months, we can get it down to zero. Uh, but we didn't, we thought, look, it's been already six months. We've given we got them, we give them six months to do this. Um, and we were sort of really keen to get started because it was our first one. I guess we were like you know, itching. And, and it's funny because we, we didn't go all the way. We should have. Uh, however, we took the 70 grand uh, hit, uh, but then it took us six months to get funding. And then we could have used that six months to then, you know what I mean? To actually go yeah, back yeah, yeah. all the way. But, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing again. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. But what I really like, by, and, and it goes back to one of the words you described yourself as is dynamic and, and the way that you continue the momentum. So as soon as one thing is done, you're already looking to do the next thing and keep that flow going. The fact that you bought those um, two investors out, um, are you still doing with, any, anything with those two guys or are you continuing to you know find deals for yourself and take them through with the planning consultants that you're using not really unfortunately they weren't the type two. they were very different profiles one right. of them really wanted to just be a landlord and do different completely different things they don't want to do anything with development so we our parts didn't really you know match our goals didn't match they're different goals so in terms of when you're looking for joint venture partners, because I know you're very good at finding finance and working with people, um, whether you're looking for variable equity investors or whether you're looking for fixed return, what is, how, how do you go about that whole process? Because I'm sure that you started in one way and as you've become more experienced, you look at things slightly differently. For people out there looking for equity investors, debt investors, private investors, what would you suggest the things that they should look out for? What are the things that you should, uh, what, that you look out for yourself? I'd say very much speak to people, uh, create those long-term relationships, I think. A lot of my investors have come from uh, just speaking to people and forming those long-term relationships. And then eventually they'll come up and say to you, well, actually, I've got some money. Uh, would you like some? You know, it's, that's how it's happened right. pretty much. You're not really going for them because they have money. You don't know that, right? You don't know. Formulate those relationships with people, generally speaking. And if you're wanting to reach out, then reach out to people like, I would say, create an investor pack. Because that's what I've re recently, I've done, I've just refined my investor pack. I attended a, a conf an online conference again, and they talked about the need of having a very slick one. So now I've got a really slick one. Um, but before I just approached them, you know, just like be yourself. I think be authentic. That's what investors want. Be yourself completely and say, look, be, um, honest with the numbers, what is it that you need? But I'd say the more people you tell that you're doing this, um, then the more people get interested. And don't ever ask people directly for money and just say, you know who, you know, I think it's worked well. So, you know, you'd say, oh, I'm looking, uh, I'm, I'm doing this project, I'm looking for a 50 grand loan. The last project I did, or maybe if you don't have the last project, say, you know, uh, I know one of my colleagues is paying 8%. I think if I look at the numbers on this project, I can offer, you know, X, but don't off ask for money directly because that would put both your, both of you in an awkward position because, you know, not everyone's comfortable with that money topic. And if you just say, who do you know, who might be interested? And I think now is a great time actually for, for money. It's, it is, a, that's a nice, interesting kind of segue into another conversation that you're opening the door to somebody and see if they walk through it. So you'd basically, um, yeah, I mean, I, if you're going to ask somebody if they know, then they say, well, I know some, I mean, it's the old adage. People don't like to be sold to, but they love to buy. So if you just put something on the shelf rather than sticking it in front of them directly, they'll go and pick it off the shelf and they'll go and buy it from you. So that's actually quite a nice little tip. Um, and in term, and then they'll tell you as well what their appetite is, I guess. They'll say, well, you know, oh, if you're offering fixed return, what's the security, what's the term, what's the return? Um, 
and if it's equity, it's the same thing. You know, you say, well, I'm looking for an equity investor and, and the same conversation goes by and you see who's got the appetite and who doesn't and you filter out, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. The more people you yeah. know, the more chance you've got of finding someone, as you mentioned. So is that how J6 came about? J6, I always wanted a community locally to me because, you know, uh, not being sort of central London, as it were, I felt sometimes property can be lonely and, uh, you know, you're not going to ever be able to have all the knowledge and the experience. You want to really learn it from other people, you know, and I think a community is a great way to do that because there are more, you know, experienced people, more experienced and less experienced than you. And you just sort of you know, sponge off the ones who've got more experience and then give it back to the people who, who, you know, who are new and are asking you for some help or reaching out to you. I think community is great. And I've always wanted to run an event and that's when I started it. I think it's uh, been four years now, 2016, May. Yeah, I've never been back yet. I think that's the way to go forward is collaborate through a community, I'd say. Yeah, and uh, you've had some great speakers uh, from planning consultants to finance brokers and lenders, um, right through to developers and investors, from commercial to residential. Um, in terms of the network that you've built, um, what... Um, uh, I mean, what is the what is the biggest takeaways that you've kind of learned? Is it it was it to go into the development side of things rather than to grow a huge portfolio? You know, what were the big takeaways from the yeah from the networking? I'm just trying to think. Uh, I'd say I think we all underestimate the power of the network. You really don't know who is going to approach you, whether it's a month, whether it's money, a deal, knowledge. I mean, I'd say. I'll give you an example, like only a couple of days ago, I saw this great potential property and I sent it to one of my planning consultants within 48 hours, this amazing detailed appraisal just came through, you know, giving you exactly the pros and cons, why you should go for this development. You know what I mean? It's just like, I would never be able to get that if I didn't have this community. Yes. And like a, this particular planning consultant has been speaking at my, has spoken at my events. So I think you great, develop this great rapport as, as a host but even if you're not a host, you just go there and become part of one or two communities uh, near you or near the patch where you're investing. And I think people will then really get to know you and you get to know them. And I think people will invest in the real you and realize, you know, you know what you're talking about is real. And as I said, be yourself, be authentic. Absolutely. The power of the network can come up with so many opportunities and so many different ideas that lead to so many awesome things. Um, one of the things that you mentioned and one of the things that I get asked time and time again is how do you find deals loads of there's no one way you have to literally put your fingers in many 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 pies so i do like a block email to commercial agents on a fortnightly basis so what i did was i just went onto a website e link found a list created a list and i've got like a virtual uh, admin assistant a full-time virtual admin um, va and i just taught her how to do it so I do a block email to commercial agents once a fortnight. That's one of the ways. But then I also pick up the phone. I also uh, have registered with lots of off-market off -market agents. Um, I do uh, Nimbus and Land Insight. I uh, go direct to vendor. I do lettering. So I've learned that. Wow. I only just started recently doing that. So I'd say the last couple of months of lockdown, I'm focusing on creating those systems. Because, you know, I'd rather, like, I, I think 2021, I want to go to like a four day week and I want to be able to have those systems in place yeah. with the lecturing, with the direct to vendor letters and all that. So that's what I'm focusing on. There's no one sort of size fits so all. just have to give trying to different routes and something will click. Yeah, again, it's it's putting stuff out there, meeting yeah. more people and making those connections, whether you're sending emails or letters or telephone calls. The more people you speak to, the more people that know what you're doing, the more opportunities you'll get to see. And that way you can find the ones that really work and the ones that are not, which obviously the ones that don't work are a lot more than the ones that work. So in terms of the analysis, are you, are you quite an analytical person yourself? Do you, are you the one that runs all the numbers? I think I do. I wouldn't say I'm super analytical, uh, but I am. I think I'd say, yeah, I mean, like as in for appraisal, you mean the deal appraisals? Yeah, yeah. Making sure the numbers work, the build costs, and then obviously the GDV, and, and then 
making sure that the margin is right. And then when you're doing that on so many different deals, it's, you know, very spreadsheet heavy. I, I wouldn't say, I think I've got spreadsheets. So every deal that I do, I do a high level appraisal first before I go into the next level of it. So that's my first sort of entry level. And I'm good at that. The next level down, I, I can't do like, I can't be looking at spreadsheets all day. I'll go insane. But <laughs> I think I'm sort of very high level. I've got a gut feel, but I do have some, I think I'm sort of jack of all trades, if I say so. That's what, I think that's what business people are there and entrepreneurs. They, they know a lot. Uh, no, they know a little bit about a lot. And the super technical people, they know a lot about something, uh, a little. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a sign of an entrepreneur, in my opinion. And how is it working in a husband and wife duo? Um, in t- you know, the, obviously you've got the stuff at home, but you've got the things in the business uh, where you've got to share all the responsibilities. Is that an easy thing? Uh, does it get a little bit of a gray area sometimes over dinner? Do you carry things into dinner or are they not allowed to arrive to the dinner table? So how does that all work? Because, you know, power couples are a huge, huge uh, sought after perception in in many people's eyes. Yeah, I think it was much harder when we started because it was very much who's good at what. I mean, no one quite knows, right? When you're just starting out. So I think over time, it sort of sorted itself out. But it was very hard at the beginning because I didn't know what Romy's strengths were as a in a business sense, you know what I mean? Because yeah. in, a, in, a, in a sort of husband-wife sense, it's different. You don't discuss any of the work or numbers or criteria in a, yeah. in a, you know, in a private relationship. So <laughs> it was really, really hard. Uh, but I think it sorted itself out. And now what happens is we have a structure. So I do all the deal appraisals, high level, you know, finding sites, finding uh, vendors, direct vendors, all that. And then when a deal is actually something that we might be doing, then he'll get into the very heavy detail numbering numbers and he'll like then go into the next level of detail. But I'll do all the, you know, front load it. And then in terms of marketing properties, the ones that we own, the HMOs, as I mentioned, we already have to do some of the marketing ourselves, all the online stuff, social media stuff, and he'll do all the meeting the tenants on site and, you know, selling because he's great at sales i'm great at marketing so i guess it sort of worked itself out funnily enough but yeah sometimes it can go on the dinner table and it's not very nice so <laughs> i just now i just say look let's just keep it back Let, let's talk about it tomorrow let's just cut it off and you know i think we've sort of learned how to deal with it so it's not too bad now but yes it was challenging to start with it, I mean, it is the signs of a really strong and healthy relationship if you can make business and um, and family life work together. Um, I mean, you you mentioned uh, part of the portfolio man- uh, management and something we mentioned just before we came live that um, you've started to have uh, thoughts about self managing a lot of the properties because you find it easier that rather than dealing with certain estate agents. Can you can you share a little bit about? I mean, have you been having difficulties with the state agents? Is that your experience? So the, so the blocks of flats that we own, those are managed by agents. And agents are great at managing blocks of flats and things like that, self-contained units, because that's what they historically did. But when it came to managing the HMOs, which are the shared houses, uh, we have tried using quite a lot of uh, agents. And those are the ones that we manage ourselves. Because A, what happens is if you give it to an agent, the costs spiral out of control. So where, where there's small maintenance issues and what have you, they'll give it to people without realizing the costs are adding up quite a lot. And then any profit that you've got left just disappears. So we're having to go, take it back as a result of that. And we haven't found any HMO agents, I think, who are great. Um, so those are the only ones we manage. Anything else? You know, I'll be honest with you. I, my ideal goal is I'm going to take somebody on board so my VA does all the contract work and the paperwork and the, con- you know, the, the admin work. But in terms of the viewings and stuff, we do it ourselves. Um, but eventually my target is by the end of this year, I want full-time office assistant to take over all of that as well. So I'm, I'm looking to heavily systemize things completely so I can focus on what I really want to do. Yeah, because I, th- I think once you get to a certain size of portfolio, those management costs that you're spending 10% a month or whatever it might be, including of that or a plus fat, that you're giving to a local agent, you could actually start to claw those back and pay somebody in-house to be your local, your in-house property manager. That's the plan. 
That's great. And, um, and, in, and where are you right now? Are you on site on any projects? Are you doing anything live at the moment? Yeah, we are. So one of the projects that we are doing, uh, we completed literally, I think, a week before lockdown. There was a block of floor flats uh, in Watford. Unfortunately, can you believe it? We're still in July right now and we still haven't refinanced it. So the development exit, obviously, uh, term finished, I think, end of March. Uh, and they have been very good, to be fair. And we almost completed a refinance, but the lender was being very, very difficult. So unfortunately, we are now going to another lender, but we are still in this position, which is really quite um, difficult because if the development loan funder decides to be difficult, they can, you know what I mean? Because yeah, of we're, course. We're, ha we're struggling a little bit with that, but we are hoping we cross the line very soon on that. Um, we've got Bracknell, which is a, a site of two houses. That's currently going on. We had uh, three or four weeks during COVID where we completely shut the site down. And, um, and since then we've been back. So there's construction work going on. And at the end of the project, which we're expecting to be around first week in August, we'll have a 11 bed HMO, two different houses. So it will be a five bed and a six bed HMO. Um, it was actually a five bed H. Remember the first HMO I bought? The first, yeah. very first one? this is the one. We got planning yeah. for dwelling on the side. This was a very big oh. pot. Yeah, what so, an absolutely brilliant acquisition. When you buy yeah. those ones where you can see, ah, one day I'm going to be able to do with something and you've actually come around to that point where you're doing something with the side. What are you, what are you putting on the side? So now, so initially it was a six bed HMO. Now it's going to be a six bed and a five bed HMO, two separate houses. Oh my days. Well, no. isn't, isn't, isn't Reading an Article 4 area? No, Bracknell. Article 4 ah. in Reading is only in certain areas. And this is in right. Bracknell. So there's no article for up until now. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. That's very interesting. So you've, um, that's an amazing, I mean, that, that's for me kind of where you get future value adds, uh, where you're making good income right now, and then you're sitting on uh, something that you can do later on down the line. I think that that's the perfect way of doing property investment. Absolutely. So well done yeah. for that. Thank you. And in... Where would you, you know, where do you see this going in the next uh, for yourself? You know, where, because you mentioned you're going to scale back to a four day week. Um, is it just kind of ticking over at the more or less at the pace that you're going and, and building a nice income generating portfolio, doing the odd development here and then having a better quality of life? Is that kind of where you envision Chopra properties going? I think what we're looking to, my vision is in 2022, I want to um, acquire in total 100 units. So at the moment, uh, with the pipeline that we've currently got, we'll probably be about 75. So I want to acquire another 25 units uh, until uh, next year. Uh, so I have retained that. That gives me a great cash flow. Uh, and then my vision is to then divide my time between doing more developments uh, and uh, helping out as well. I've got a vision. I want to uh, a slum development back in Mumbai. I want to go and help create some housing there for slums and stuff like that. So I've got a vision like, you know, from 2022 onwards, I want to still be here, still be doing lots of developments. Um, I'm never going to stop working, I don't think, but uh, just try and give back a bit more as well, you know, uh, because then I'll be very comfortable in my position, as you said, full-time office manager. And then I can just, uh, yeah, pick and choose what I want to do, but do more development focus. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't see you the kind of person to slow down entirely. You're always going to, you seem to be the person that's always going to be busy doing something or other. Um, yeah. in, and, and to go from 2010 to now, and you've got 75 units um, under management. Yeah, I will be. If I, once I finish this last uh, pipeline, yeah, by the end of this year. Wow, that is really, uh, units, really units, not houses, but like each room is a unit as well, right? Got you, got you, got you. Yeah, yeah. And so not uh, 75 houses, I wish, but yeah. <laughs> how, yeah, how, how do you find the, um, the HMOs over the single lets? Because, I mean, HMOs, uh, they, everyone says that they get more, they're more and more saturated in the marketplace. Um, are you still finding good opportunities within that? I mean, obviously you've got the one that you're sitting on, which is an existing piece of land. So you get that kind of land for free and it, and it makes it, makes it worthwhile. But is, is HMO still something or are you continuing with the development of, um, of kind of sing, uh, single let style properties? You know, I think with COVID, uh, we definitely feel people 
want more self-contained stuff. And even like the HMOs that we don't have on some of them, they don't have all ensuite rooms. We're finding those a bit of trouble to rent out because everybody wants an ensuite room right now. So I think we're going to keep focusing on apartments and houses, but with maybe more amenity space, because obviously we realize we won't need more space, right? Like a home office type thing, because we know the future is going to be a lot more home working. It's not going to be completely uh, uh, home working, but there will be a lot more home working, I think, going forward. I don't know if you agree or not. Yeah, 100%. Um, so I'd, I'd say definitely self-contained units. So I don't think I'm going to be doing more HMOs, after, you know, unless something really falls into my lap, which I think is a great one. But I'm not going to be intentionally looking out for buying more HMOs. I'd say more developments of flats and houses. And you've, you're, you're based in Reading, doing stuff in Bracknell. You've got a project in Watford. Is that pretty much the furthest you go? Or would you consider doing projects like, say, up in Manchester or something like that? I'd say I'd have to have the right team in place. You know, I wouldn't do it if it was just me and somebody else from the Southeast. If a Manchester-based team approached me on a deal, which, you know, which would make sense, then yes. As long as I can trust them to run the project. Because operationally, I can't, of course, be there, right? And as you know, I've got a family, although my kids are grown up and they're probably they're going to be leaving home soon, actually, to go to university. So um, even then, I think you've got to be a bit practical as well, right? Because you don't want another job. You've left your job for the reason, for the quality and the freedom, and you don't want to just then go back and do exactly that and be a slave to that. Yeah, I think that that's something that um, I find time and time again, even with my own experience. Um, I mean, I've got a property in the Northeast, a uh, uh, 12-bed HMO, and it's about having people in the local area that you, you know, like, and trust that they're going to be able to deliver the kind of service that you need. Um, otherwise, it can give you much more work than it's you know, the it's reward. It's yeah. Worked, right? yeah, absolutely. So, in, so all in all, in terms of um, COVID-19, You've, you mentioned a couple of things that uh, have affected you um, with regards to the lack of en suites in some of the HMOs and some of the delays you've had on the development finance. How, how I mean, apart from those things, how, how has COVID-19 and the, the, the lockdown treated you? Have you found it a positive thing overall to adjust or have you found it quite a nuisance and it got in the way of your business? Positive, very positive, actually. I've actually got my head down, as I mentioned to you, on systems, which... I always procrastinate because it's not maybe my natural ability. You know, you always have this natural strength and ability to do something and then everything else you have to work for, right? So it's not my natural strength, but a bit my IT background, obviously I have the ability to do it. Uh, so I've really focused on getting those done direct to end. You know, remember I mentioned direct to vendor letters and yeah. letters. So that I'm, I'm doing all that, systemizing all that right now. And I'm also completing on a site, actually. So we actually got planning permission for another site. Uh, this is in Surbiton this time. Uh, we bought uh, something quite different, actually. So in January earlier this year, we bought a, a vacant A1, about 600 square feet, a small vacant. Um, uh, it was uh, vacant for many, many years. So very run down, and it needed a lot of work doing to it. We bought it subject to planning. So we did, we did a conditional exchange on it, paid 10% deposit. And then we put an application in for a two bedroom flat at the back. It had access from the side. Uh, so we reduced the shop to about 40 square meters. And then we created a plan, a design for a nice two bed, two bath flat with nice amenities. Oh, wow. Yeah, and we got planning in COVID. They didn't even see it. They didn't even visit the property. They told us, send us a video. We sent them a video of a property and they gave us a planning permission based on the design. They, said, they even commented, said, oh, brilliant design. Your architects and a great, great job. And Excellent. They left it. And that, uh, was that permitted development or was that full planning application? Funnily enough, good point, actually. It would have been permitted development if it was in a normal area, but because it was in a conservation area, right. it needed planning. Interesting. Scope because, you know, for the reasons I mentioned. So we are now in the process, if not this week, next week, complete on it. And then we've got builders all agreed to start on site as soon as we, we complete. Manny, I absolutely love talking with you. Um, you, you mentioned to me a while back that uh, you might be getting into, uh, um, you might have a mentoring program. Is that something that's uh, happening? We did go with the mastermind and uh, I was going to kick it off in 2020, but then I realized that I had too much on my plate and I wouldn't be able to give it justice. So I will do it 
it's happening, but it's probably going to be delayed for a couple of years. So I'd say 2022 possibly. Because, yeah, you've got so much going on. It's, um, it's always great to see somebody like yourself setting up these masterminds, mentoring and uh, networking events so that they can be part of the community that you create and, and, the, and the, the buzz that you create around property. And I feel Thank like we could, talk, we could talk forever, but we have run out of time. Um, if people wanted to reach out to you and uh, connect with you, what's the best way they could find you? Well, go to my website, uh, mannychopra.com. Uh, with a double N, or they can email me, manny at mannychopper.com. Those are the best ways. Uh, my website's, you know, been running for a while. It's the best way to contact me and email me. Or Twitter. You. Twitter, you're on Twitter. LinkedIn. I'm on everywhere. I'm everywhere, Sam. <laughs> Where do you find the time, Manny? How do, how do you manage your time? Because it's incredible how much you do get done. Um, you know, how do you manage your time? Because you've also got family life and, with, you know, how, how yeah, do you balance it all? You know what? I think preparing, planning, I would say I prepare my list in the morning. What do I need to get done? Like literally just bullet points. It doesn't be like elaborate documents or anything, just on my phone, on my notes, blah, blah, blah. What I, you know, by the end of the day, what do I need to achieve? And then if it doesn't get achieved, it moves on to the next day. It's all about the planning. And I think doing my yoga and doing my meditation helps. I know it's the old fogey stuff, but uh, it really does help. Very good. Well, I'm hoping that we can do this again in 12, 18 months time. We'll be able to do some slides and have a look at some of the projects you've worked on and we reconnect with you. Fantastic. Really, really enjoy talking to you and lovely. I love the questions. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Cheers, Sam. Thanks for tuning in today. We've got lots more super active property people coming up. So keep up to date. Click the subscribe button. Hit the bell icon. Leave us a comment, share us and find us across social media and we'll see you next time.